So welcome back to episode 42 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be about quantum engineering. And as usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com. Or you can use the YouTube live chat at the bottom or the right of your screen. Please also note a 30 second time delay between what we do here and what you see as live on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Christian Gross, who will introduce our speaker today. Christian, you're on mute. Sorry, okay, uh, second try. So uh, we are very happy uh, to have Monica speaking at the quantum science uh, seminar today. Um, and let me just quickly introduce Monica. So Monica received her PhD in 2011 uh, from MIT, where she worked on uh, cavity-induced uh, spin squeezing in Flood and Wolitisch's group. She then moved over to Munich, uh, to uh, the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and uh, the LMU, until, where she stayed until 2013 as a postdoc. And then uh, she moved over to Stanford, uh, where she is a professor since then. Um, her group now works on long-range interacting atomic systems, uh, where the long-range interactions are induced either by uh, Rydberg-induced interactions or by cavities. Um, then, uh, important to mention, she, she really received a really impressive uh, list of prizes, and I think I should just uh, uh, mentioning the most uh, recent one, Monica, I hope that's that's enough. <laughs> that's uh, uh, the Ravi Prize in AMO Physics um, awarded by the APS to outstanding early career researchers, uh, which uh, Monica, uh, without any doubt, is. Um, and now I don't want to steal any more time of Monica's and uh, hand over to her and let her speak about quantum spin dynamics with optically pro programmable interactions. Monica, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, indeed, the title of my talk is Quantum Spin Dynamics with Optically Programmable Interactions. I'll be talking about some work that we're doing controlling the in interactions between cold atoms with photons. And um, I've had for some time this dream that one day this will lead to something like an arbitrary waveform generator for quantum engineers, um, where you know perhaps one day it's really in the lab, you have a device where you can program in, here is the quantum state or the Hamiltonian that I have, and you press some buttons and press play, and you get to um, do your quantum mechanics. Okay, so that might sound um, a little bit um, far-fetched, but actually this field of cold atoms uh, is really making remarkable progress um, over the past few years in having really an exquisite degree of um, programmability, for example, of the positions of individual atoms in um, arrays of optical tweezers. Um, so I put here some pictures from a few groups around the world that hopefully many of you have, have seen um, that I think illustrate the astounding degree of control um, that one can have with the aid of, of laser light that in this case is trapping individual atoms. Um, the focus of my talk will be on um, sort of a, a complementary tool set draw, that draws some inspiration from this, which is um, how far can we come in programming not just the positions, but also the interactions between atoms with light. Um, and in particular, if you look at some pictures like, like these ones uh, above, one, one sees sort of the characteristic scale on which one can trap and image atoms is set by the wavelength of, of light. It's kind of the micron scale. And so um, for many applications, you would like to be able to um, have interactions between these atoms um, that are long range compared to that, that scale. So anywhere from, from microns um, to, to maybe um, millimeters. Um, and so uh, I'll be talk. I, I actually in my lab, I'll say there are kind of two toolboxes we use um, to optically control the interactions between atoms. Um, one that um, is explored in a number of groups around the world is, is coupling atoms to Rydberg states, and that gives um, interactions on kind of the few micron scale. Um, so there's a sense of locality, but they're, they're somewhat long ranged. And this I actually will not talk about today because I would talk too long, um, but uh, I encourage you to, to check out our work on that. What I will be focusing on is something um, where we have actually control of interactions that are even as extend as far as sort of the millimeter scale. Um, and in some sense, these interactions can be um, highly non-local. 
And the way that we do that is by letting atoms talk to each other with the aid of um, photons in an optical resonator. Um, so why would you want to do that? Why would you want to make um, what I call non-local interactions? There are a few different um, uh, reasons you might want to do this. One is that um, if you can have interactions that extend over a very long distance, that can be an efficient way to generate um, entanglement in a massively parallel fashion. Um, and that has, has been demonstrated um, uh, to realize um, a variety of entangled states of up to um, you know, hundreds of thousands of atoms, um, particularly ones um, of interest for quantum sensing and quantum metrology applications. Um, another place where non-local interactions appear um, is that there are a variety of computational problems, actually sort of technological re technologically relevant optimization problems um, that can be mapped to the problem of finding the ground state of some interacting spin system. And so um, perhaps if you can program uh, the interactions between some set of spins in the lab, maybe there's a way you can use quantum mechanics to help you find that state and solve, um, a, solve some problem um, that could be um, a scheduling problem, for example, that you would encounter in the real world. Um, and then a third direction um, where um, non-local interactions appear is actually in toy models from a range of actually other areas of physics. Um, ranging from um, condensed matter to an example I will give um, to sort of kick us off is, is quantum gravity. Um, so can you build model systems that simulate phenomena um, from, from other fields? Okay, so why quantum gravity? Um, let me first say actually why I, I first began to find this an interesting uh, field. So um, the key idea that even lets you say maybe a quantum system that I build in the lab has some connection to gravity is the following. Um, the idea is that if I have a quantum system in D spatial dimensions, and in this example, D is one, um, so I have this one dimensional chain with periodic boundary conditions. In certain cases, um, this might be some strongly interacting quantum system that um, looks um, uh, complicated and difficult to, to, find, to solve the properties of, of, from a quantum mechanical perspective. Um, but in certain cases, there's a simpler picture um, that emerges by saying, I can view the complex quantum correlations in this system um, as telling me something about some effective geometry of the system. So the correlations between the spins um, give rise to some effective geometry, and that's a geometry in one additional dimension. Um, so I think of the system as living on the boundary of some space, um, and the curvature of that space encodes something about the correlations in the system. And in certain cases, um, that, can be, that can be thought of as uh, essentially uh, space-time curvature arising from gravity. So there's this mapping where in some cases sort of, you know, we think quantum many body systems are, are complicated and the description is exponentially large, but in certain cases, maybe one can actually have some simpler picture um, for thinking about these correlations. Um, so to me, you know, that was an exciting idea because it raises the question, um, is this, you know, is this something we could probe experimentally in some simple model systems, maybe in systems where we don't know whether there is such an emergent geometry, but uh, you can find it out in an experiment. And if so, could that give you a starting point for having a different lens through which to understand quantum many body physics? So um, if you want to even, you know, explore these ideas, you need some sort of testable prediction from this duality between quantum mechanics and gravity. And um, the one that uh, you um, may have heard of and that I first heard of um, is dealing with the simplest possible system from the gravitational perspective, which is a black hole. And the conjecture is that if I had um, something that looks from the gravity side like a black hole, quantum mechanically, that would be a system that exponentially quickly um, scrambles information, which is to say if I had some locally encoded information, it would very quickly become delocalized in quantum correlations among um, uh, many particles. And if you think about studying this process in the lab, you would start by asking, well, what are the toy models that theorists write down to think about this? And um, one uh, uh, model is, is uh, a sort of key feature of these models is that they have very exotic looking interactions from an experimentalist's perspective. So for example, you might have um, a model of particles um, that can hop in a, in a correlated and completely non-local fashion. Um, this is called the Sachdevye Kataev model, what I've shown here on the left. Um, or uh, you might have uh, actually some of the early proposals for studying this phenomenon of fast scrambling involved um, quantum models of billiards um, that weren't moving around in sort of, you know, on a standard looking billiard table, but actually moving around on a tree graph. 
Um, so, okay, so it looks like you either need interactions that are very strange and non-local, um, or maybe you have a system that behaves in a local way, it's a billiard that's moving around, but in some very exotic geometry. Okay, so we're going to um, ask, you know, can we explore things like this in the lab? Let me start on the left with this idea of non-local couplings. We'll come back to exotic geometries later. Um, okay, so in general, if you um, are, for example, somebody who works with um, uh, uh, cold atoms in optical lattices, um, which I guess maybe some of our listeners do, you might see something where I say the particles hop in a non-local fashion and say, well, that's not, not, that's not possible, that's not physical. Um, but um, for those of us who work with atoms and photons, um, there's actually one kind of natural way to think about generating um, processes where particles can hop in a non-local fashion. And that's let to let the particles be spin excitations and their hopping be mediated by light, which is to say if I can have a process um, where I have some uh, spin exchange process, I can think of that as a particle that hopped between two sites. Um, and what we will do is let photons mediate these spin exchange processes um, and because photons travel at the speed of light, um, these processes can happen essentially instantaneous, uh, which is essentially instantaneous um, for our purposes. Um, these processes can be effectively non-local. Okay, so the concept then is I'm going to have, let's say, um, uh, in the simplest case, a, a two-level atom um, where I can think of the ground state as um, and sort of an empty site, the up state. Um, as an occupied site, and if I want to um, uh, have these interactions uh, mediated by photons, what I can do is convert um, an, a spin excitation into a photon, and then I would like that photon to be converted into a spin excitation of another atom. Um, and in order for that to happen without the photon leaving my system, we put everything between uh, two mirrors, so in an optical resonator, and that gives us an enhancement of the probability that the photon emitted by one atom will interact again with another. Um, and I think it's worth just pointing out that photon-mediated interactions show up um, by now in actually a wide range of different physical platforms from um, you know, microwave photons coupled to superconducting qubits um, uh, uh, to um, optical photons coupled to solid state defects to um, uh, atoms um, talking to optical photons in systems like the one that I will talk about. And which system you choose might depend on your application. One thing I think is, that's worth pointing out is that in these atomic systems, um, uh, one of the kind of nice features is, is the scalability. So um, there are experiments working with well-controlled interactions between um, two atoms in an optical resonator um, or between 10 to the 5 atoms in an optical resonator, depending whether the focus is on implementing quantum gates or making some massively parallel collective entanglement for quantum sensing applications. Um, so indeed, in this sphere of sort of um, the many atom regime of these cavity experiments, there are really two main directions that have um, so far been explored. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a strong track record in harnessing photon-mediated interactions um, to generate collective entangled states um, with applications, for example, to enhance atomic clocks. Um, and then another direction where there's been quite a lot of work is in simulating phenomena, primarily inspired by condensed matter physics, so ranging from um, super solidity to um, topological phases, um, and starting to explore um, what are the unique differences of systems where inherently it's a non-equilibrium system that is driven, um, driven by light. Uh, so already this, this, these systems have a quite strong track record um, in uh, the area of, of quantum simulation. We'll see if we can take this in um, a, a new direction. Um, and I'll comment here, uh, so I mentioned super solidity topological phases. Um, uh, one other uh, point that I'll mention is there have, has been work um, towards realizing spin glasses, which is another condensed matter inspired direction um, that I will comment on again briefly towards the end. So, okay, so how do you realize all of these systems in some way rely on a way to control um, interactions? Uh, and uh, in, in our case, the simplest thing we can do is this spin exchange process, but I just want to highlight in order to have this be optically controlled, the way that we do this is we turn on a drive field um, uh, consisting of, uh, in, in order to drive a Raman process, where I will have one atom um, absorb a photon from the drive field, emit into the resonator, a second atom reabsorb that photon and flip its spin uh, and re-emit into the drive. So this gives us a way to have an optically controlled spin exchange interaction. And um, in the experiment, that looks um, something like this. So here's um, our optical resonator. It's two mirrors, five centimeters apart. And in order to uh, uh, 
observe the dynamics, the type of thing we do. Initially, I'll show um, pictures where we're working just with a single spatially extended cloud, um, a sort of order millimeter scale. Um, and we can, for example, initiate the system with some spin excitations in a particular region of that cloud. So horizontal is position, vertical is time. And as a function of time, you'll see that the spin excitations hop over to another region and back. Um, there are some oscillations indicating the coherence in the system. And you can also directly start to see um, that this isn't just a system with local interactions where the spin excitations propagate outwards from this, this point A, um, but they sort of suddenly show up somewhere else, um, which highlights the non-locality of, of this, of this um, system. And why they show up exactly where they do is something it turns out we can understand very well if we know essentially um, the local density of atoms and the local intensity of the cavity mode, which is mediating their interactions. So from that, we can basically um, calculate these, these dynamics and, and they make sense. Um, so that in particular um, is, is um, in calculating those dynamics, what we so far are assuming is that we have an interaction where any pair of atoms um, interacts in proportion to the local uh, strengths of the local intensities of the cavity mode at their positions. So that's one particular form of interaction that is natural to realize in this system. Um, every atom talks to every other, but in this relatively simple way, um, if I go back to asking, does this non-local interaction, um, should I expect it to be a fast scrambler, for example, uh, the answer is, is no. There's um, theoretical work on that um, uh, uh, by Marino and Ray and um, in collaboration with Eud Altman, showing that this has some interesting features in terms of actually being slow to thermalize, um, but not a fast scrambler. Okay, um, so one thing you would like to start doing um, for any number of reasons um, in quantum simulation or quantum control is to have more flexible uh, control over the spatial structure of the interactions in these systems. Um, so, you know, just to give an illustration, a few different um, uh, sort of interaction graphs that we have thought about for various reasons um, range from maybe you would like a one to all coupling. Um, that actually uh, can be interesting for solving one particular class of optimization problem. Um, uh, maybe you would like something like that tree graph I showed before that seemed to have some connection to the fast scrambling. Um, there's a variety of interesting physics um, ranging um, from uh, proposals for other approaches to fast scrambling to also proposals for studying, let's say, spin liquids that involve a combination of local and long range interactions. So there's a range of different interaction graphs that might be re interesting to realize. Um, so we'll ask how you can get more control. Um, but before I get into that, I'll also just comment on sort of two other knobs we have in this system, um, which are the form of the interaction. So we just do we just have this spin exchange that a spin excitation can hop from one particle to another? Um, or does one also have an Ising type interaction that the Z components want to align or anti-align? Um, and in fact, can we control the sign of the interaction? Is it ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic? So these are actually um, all knobs that we have in our system. And to illustrate, I'll start by illustrating kind of the form and the sign of the interaction um, in the case of the simplest spatial structure that we naturally get. Everyone talks to everyone, weighted by the local couplings to the cavity. Um, and actually, in that simplest case, I can uh, think of the entire system um, as being described by some larger spin that is the sum of weighted sp individual spins weighted by their local couplings to the cavity. So I've written down sort of this general form of, of Hamiltonian um, in terms of some large spin F. Um, and one of the knobs we have in the system is we can control, um, do we have um, a so-called XY coupling, that's the, the flip-flop part of the interaction, or do we have an Ising coupling or some combination of both? So it turns out this is something we directly can control just by tilting a magnetic field relative um, to the axis of the resonator. Um, so uh, the magnetic field doesn't appear in the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is written in a rotating frame, but physically in the lab, what we're doing is tilting a magnetic field. And one way you can think about this is that the physics of the interactions comes about from the magnetization of the atoms coupling to the polarization of the light in the cavity. Um, and when I write down a Hamiltonian, my quantization axis is that of the field. If it's along the cavity, then um, the Z component of the spins are what couples to the cavity. If it's perpendicular, then the X and Y components are rotating and alternately coupling to the cavity. Um, and so that gives us control over the form of the interaction and the sign of the interaction is simply controlled by the frequency of the laser or right, the tuning of the laser from resonance. 
Um, and that's kind of illustrated here, tuning the field angle um, tunes, tunes the, these couplings, and we can realize them with either sign. Roughly the way that we measure this, by the way, is essentially looking at the dynamics of the system, initializing in some simple state with a spin texture, um, let's say some spins here around aligned along Z, some other spins aligned along X or minus X, and watching if we have an Ising interaction that the Z these spins along Z should cause an effective field that makes the other spins process. And by measuring the rate and direction of that procession, we can extract the form of interactions in our system. So we can kind of verify the interactions by looking at the dynamics. Um, and we also can kind of cross check that um, um, the system is behaving in a sensible way by looking also at kind of what are the low energy states of the system, right? I say we can have ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic interactions. Can I really see that in the tendency of the spins to, to align or anti-align? Um, and so just to kind of illustrate that, um, one thing we can do is, is do some kind of a slow quench where we try to prepare the system in um, roughly its, its, its ground state or some low energy state. Um, so in the simplest case of a non-interacting system, for example, um, just as a sort of a reference point, we could initialize the spins in some um, effective field along Z and um, just rotate slowly that field and the spins should follow. And we can plot what is the magnetization along Z as a function of the tilt of this field. And it goes from you know, down to up in a way that you would expect, um, tracking, tracking this slowly changing effective field. Um, so really this is, a, I'll just say this is a coupling between the states and, and the detuning that we use to tune this effective field. So now um, if we turn on interactions, you can ask how does this change? Um, and if you do the same thing in the presence of interactions, um, let's say I have some choice, but let's take ferromagnetic Ising interactions, there's quite a dramatic change where all of a sudden I see a very sharp um, jump from as I rotate my field, the spins either want to point down or suddenly they'll flip two up. Um, and there's sort of a knife edge um, where this transition happens um, that uh, is due to this ferromagnetic interaction. The spins all want to align with each other. The opposite effect happens if I, if I switch the sign of interaction, which I can summarize in some kind of plot of the magnetic susceptibility in this system. And in particular, as we approach some critical strength of this Ising interaction um, relative to the transverse field, we see behavior consistent with a divergence in this magnetic susceptibility. Um, that's that knife edge in the plot, um, very strong sensitivity to small changes in the Z field. Um, and, and that makes some sense. That's a transition from a paramagnetic to a ferromagnetic phase. Now, interestingly, if you have um, instead spin exchange interactions, um, this plot of the magnetic susceptibility, that's the green curve now, looks almost the same, except it's the mirror image. Um, and so, you know, why is that? Why is it the mirror image? Um, well, one way to understand this is I said I can roughly think of this as one large spin to some weighted couplings of the individual atoms. Um, but it turns out in the simplest case, if the weights were all uniform, they're not, but if they were all uniform, then I could um, write down an exact equivalence between um, this Ising interaction term, Fz squared, um, and xy interactions of the opposite sign up to some term that involves the length of the total spin, um, which in some ideal case might be a constant if, if um, the interactions with the cavity mode are all um, symmetric. So this indicates that sort of roughly you could expect a symmetry where having Ising interactions of one sign is similar to having X, Y interactions of the other sign, and that kind of makes this plot make sense. But um, if we want to start exploring um, some interesting many-body physics and not just the physics of a single spin, then maybe this should make us unhappy because I said this, is act this shows it's acting like one large spin. Um, so now you can ask the question, can we see a difference um, between these two cases? And so it turns out one place where you can immediately see a difference is if you subject the system to an inhomogeneous um, magnetic field. Actually, even without trying, there was some small magnetic field gradient in our system that shows up in the winding of the phase as a function of time. And uh, so again, horizontal is position, vertical is time. You can see some phase uh, winding uh, as a function of time in the absence of any interactions. That's just showing there's a magnetic field gradient. If we turn on interactions, the behavior is quite different. So now all of a sudden, um, what you'll see is that this plot of, again, color is phase. The color looks um, kind of uniform. It's a very boring picture <laughs> because the spins are all staying aligned. Um, so we initialize them all aligned. They stay aligned. Um, and this is true in the presence of these spin exchange interactions. Um, so kind of to summarize that, this is the phase winding across the cloud. For no interactions, it winds. For Ising interactions, it winds. But for spin exchange interactions, for these XY interactions, um, the phase winding is suppressed. Um, 
So this is actually a neat effect that tells us that the interactions are suppressing dephasing of the spins um, and helping actually protect the coherence of the system. Um, one way to think about that, and this was nicely pointed out in work by James Thompson and Anna Maria Ray, um, is that this term, um, I said maybe it's roughly constant, but actually this term can matter um, in our, uh, uh, that distinguishes the Ising from the XY interactions. It says basically that um, uh, states of different total spin have different energies. And so there's sort of an energy gap between the um, space of, of maximal total spin and spaces that, uh, of spin uh, and the situation where the spins are starting to dephase and the total spin is shorter. Um, and so that energy gap, the fact that there's an energy cost to changing the length of the spin actually helps protect the coherence of the system. Um, and that could be particularly interesting in situations where you want to use the light in any case um, to generate some interactions that will make an entangled state. Um, but if you have a choice of how you do it, um, you'd like to do it in a way that protects you from any um, dephasing caused, well, either by stray fields, like in my case, but also perhaps by the light itself. Um, and so this is interesting potentially directly in the cavity QED context, but also um, perhaps a, a proof of principle of a phenomenon that is useful also if you want to generate entanglement in shorter range interacting systems where you actually need a way to combat um, interaction induced dephasing. Um, so this could be relevant to a range of different platforms. At this point, I'm actually going to pause and ask whether there are questions. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Indeed, uh, there are many questions, uh, which shows that the talk is uh, very exciting. So let me start with uh, one um, that is, uh, can you say more about what precisely uh, one can learn about black holes and quantum gravity from a starting fast scrambling in spin systems? So um, uh, to me, fast scrambling is, a, is primarily a starting point. Um, for asking sort of how we um, can connect sort of experimental tools to um, testing some of the broader ideas that are coming from quantum gravity. And to me, actually, the broader idea um, is, is that in certain cases, we can visualize entanglement in terms of geometry and space-time curvature. I, I find that, so, and maybe just to give a little background, I actually, you know, I showed earlier some pictures of certain quantum states, like squeeze states, where we can draw a nice simple picture. Um, and that's incredibly useful for thinking about the system. But for sort of generic many-body quantum systems, um, you can't just draw a nice simple picture. <laughs> There's this exponentially large density matrix that describes the system. And so um, finding new ways of kind of simplifying that down and having some simplified description seems generically very powerful. And so there are two aspects to, the, to this. One is maybe, can we learn something about quantum gravity? Like, is gravity a phenomenon in, our, in the real world? Is gravity a phenomenon that emerges from entanglement? That, that's one, one thing that one could hope to study. But to be honest, to me, that feels more like something for the theorists. Um, um, if they tell me what to measure, maybe I can help, but that's more for the theorists. But then for those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about quantum mechanics, I'm intrigued by the idea, um, can this gravitational picture give us new tools for thinking about many body quantum mechanics? And so to start to explore that, you need some predictions. And fast scrambling is the first prediction I ever heard that was you know, that something about, here's, here, you know, here's a concrete prediction about something that should be measurable in the quantum system. And maybe I didn't say it, but the, there's a precise sort of prediction about a fundamental um, limit that applies to all quantum systems um, in terms of the rate at which this scrambling process can occur. But I gave that just as sort of an, an illustration of, so here are some systems where there are concrete predictions, but I don't want to say that that's the only thing that's interesting to study. Um, and in fact, I'll sort of start to point toward later in my talk towards asking, can we probe um, um, this general idea of some emergent geometry? Good. Uh, then there is a question from the chat from Isaiah Gray. And the question is, uh, is a quantum system that scrambles as fast as possible always a black hole? So the conjecture is um, that, let, let me see. So, there, so there's a fundamental limit um, on the rate of scrambling. And the conjecture is that the systems that saturate that limit are the ones that are dual to black holes. Um, now, I think the question is, um, could you have another system that is not dual to a black hole, but that still scrambles at, at, this, at this rate? Um, and it, this is basically a, a fundamental limit that's set by essentially um, a, a, the temperature of the system. Um, so as a function of the temperature, there's a rate at which this process should occur. Um, and uh, that is something where um, 
Uh, I'm not going to try to answer that question because I, I'm not. I'm not. The whole thing is a conjecture, right? So, um, uh, but I'll say that it, from sort of um, maybe an experimental standpoint, if you want to sort of identify candidates for being black holes under holographic duality, that is a signature you would look for. Um, is it possible to be a fast scrambler without being a black hole? I, um, I would defer to a theorist on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. And um, then there is another question. Uh, what's the difference between the connectivity graph in such a cavity with n atoms and the connectivity graph of a linear change of ions in a common harmonic trap? In particular, which one do you see as more programmable? So there's a very strong analogy um, between uh, atoms coupled to photons in an optical resonator and ions that talk to each other via their motional modes. Um, so it's essentially, you know, the mapping is for photons in the one case go to phonons in the other case. Um, now, in trapped ions, one of the tricks that has been played to tune the interactions um, is basically um, to have sort of multiple frequency components that are used to adjust the strength of coupling to different motional modes and thereby basically control the power law of the interaction. Um, there are other approaches that involve, you know, I guess, locally addressing the ions, right? That can give a high degree of programmability. Um, in general, there, there, is some, there are some limitations on sort of the power laws that are natural to realize in the ion systems. But again, with local addressing, you can kind of do anything. Um, I will get more into the programmability later in my talk. Um, so maybe I will just say that I think, you know, the current state of sort of what's easy and what's hard in the two systems is, is a little bit different. But actually one of the, the there's a scheme I'll show for programming interactions um, where very recently, as we were doing this in our cavity experiments, we saw a proposal for doing the same thing with trapped ions um, uh, recently published. And so, yeah, the, the, there are very strong um, analogies. And I think the techniques in many cases are transferable. Okay. Uh, great, Monica. There are more questions, but I, I suggest we continue, and uh, uh, then we have the questions at, uh, after your talk. Thank great. You. Okay. Um, perfect. So um, I will. Just, okay. So so we had left off um, uh, showing that we can use the interactions to protect the coherence of the spins. Um, I had shown you some measurements of magnetic susceptibility, um, kind of illustrating uh, the control of, of the, the Ising interactions and the XY interactions. Some of the measurements I showed, you know, do the spins want to align or, or, or anti-align? Um, you could understand actually in a fairly classical picture, and I kind of advertise this as something quantum. So I want to um, give you a little bit more confidence that there's something quantum going on. Um, one nice way to kind of um, probe the system and to, to sort of really see a signature of the quantum dynamics um, is to take advantage of the fact that each of our atoms, I didn't say it before, but actually each of our atoms is a spin one. Um, so these are rubidium atoms, the ground state is a spin one. And one thing you can do, for example, is initialize all atoms in the m equals zero state of this spin one system. Um, and so from sort of a classical physics perspective, you might say, well, I have zero magnetization. And if the magnetization is what couples to the light field, then that will be boring and you know, nothing will happen if I put these spin zero, m equals zero atoms in the cavity. Um, but that's not true. And from a sort of a more quantum perspective, you might um, intuit that something should happen. So for example, if I have these spin exchange interactions, this F plus F minus interaction, um, then um, what I can do is take two m equals zero atoms and turn them into a plus one minus one pair. Um, so here are basically 100 um, repetitions of the same experiment where we start with um, uh, basically all atoms in the m equals zero state. And uh, at, after turning on the light that controls the interactions for some time, we measure the populations in these three different states. Um, and you see basically, um, well, first of all, you notice maybe large fluctuations, um, but you'll see that there uh, is a correlation between atoms appearing in the minus one state and atoms appearing in the plus one state. Um, and this is a signature of a process where um, uh, we're yeah, essentially generating um, via these photon mediated interactions, um, correlated atom pairs in the minus one and plus one state is how we understand this physics. And this is actually something that um, uh, may be familiar from kind of uh, other um, physical platforms that you may have worked with. So um, one example, a direct analogy that actually it sort of inspired us to try this is in Bose-Einstein condensates, one can have collisional interactions in spin one systems where directly direct collisions between two um, m equals zero atoms give rise to pairs of plus and minus one atoms. Um, I also think of it a little bit like generating you know, correlated photon pairs. Um, 
But um, in uh, so you might ask sort of what's different about doing this um, with photon mediated interactions. Um, one kind of neat feature is, is that it's fast. That sort of happens on the sub millisecond scale. Um, um, but also you could start to ask, can I use the fact that these are not direct local interactions, but long range light mediated interactions to start to program in some way with the light field, the structure of the um, spatial correlations that I generate in these systems, um, which in the simplest case would, would be sort of uniform correlations across the entire cloud. Um, every atom equally correlated with every other. So um, in order to start to um, explore that direction um, and to do it cleanly, we decided um, let's actually um, op start operating with actually an array of atomic ensembles so we can more, um, more directly probe spatial correlations. Um, so we work um, now with an array of um, uh, typically about 18 um, sites, each of which has one or 2,000 atoms in it. Um, and um, we'll put many atoms in each site because for the time being, we benefit actually from having some collective enhancement in the atom light interaction strength. Um, okay, and so the question is how far can we come in starting to kind of program um, the structure of the interactions between these ensembles? And, um, you know, I, I said I might want an arbitrary waveform generator for Hamiltonians. We'll be a little bit more modest and say, can we make any translation invariant couplings here? Um, so control the, the dependence um, of the interactions on distance. Okay. Um, so that will be our goal to control the dependence of the interactions on distance. Um, and in order to do that, actually, the first thing we need to do is we want to kind of shut down this all to all interaction that we most naturally get where every atom can talk to any other. And so in order to do that, um, we apply a magnetic field gradient across the system. And um, so in the presence of the magnetic field gradient, then we can measure when we turn on this pair creation process. So we um, uh, initialize the atoms in M equals zero. We turn on um, the, this F plus F minus interaction. And we look at the positions, correlations between the, pos the number of atoms in the plus one state on site I and the number of atoms in the minus one state on site J. Okay, and so this correlation plot um, shows strong correlations here on the diagonal. Um, and uh, that's essentially showing that we have made the interactions local, right? So um, you see correlations between the number of atoms in state plus one and state minus one on the same site and not on different sites. And that's because we've introduced some energy cost um, to, sorry, some energy cost to creating a plus one minus one pair unless the atoms are on the same site. That's what the gradient does for us. And now um, in order to control the interactions, controllably turn on interactions again at some distance, um, all we need to do is drive the cavity not with a single frequency, but with two frequencies. So if we now have um, two frequencies in our control field, um, then the energy difference between these photons can bridge that energy cost of creating a plus one minus one pair at a particular distance. And so now you start to see correlations showing up kind of off the diagonal, right? So we've controllably turned on interactions um, at a distance specified by this frequency difference. Um, and that generalizes, first of all, to varying the frequency, um, uh, the, essentially the modulation frequency of the drive field. Um, and as we vary that frequency, um, so frequency is the vertical axis, distance is the horizontal axis, and you can see the correlations that are strong sort of tracking the frequency um, separation between these two drive fields. Okay, um, and you can actually zoom in and, and this is very precise control, right? So we can really control are the interactions on at a distance of nine sites or 10 sites or 11 sites. Um, and so you can imagine this now generalizes because in the spectrum of the laser field is easy to control. Um, and so that should allow me with a multi-frequency drive to essentially generate um, arbitrary couplings versus distance. Okay, so we'll get to generalizing in a moment. Before we do that, I like to give a little bit more of sort of the intuition for how I, I think about this physics. So there's a picture um, uh, in, in kind of um, real space where the frequency separation between um, sort of teeth of my drive field um, dictates the distance at which interactions are on. Um, and there's also a complementary picture in momentum space, um, which, which is that essentially I'm modulating my drive field. Um, the faster I modulate, um, the longer the distance at which I have these couplings. Um, and I can essentially think of it as um, that modulation waveform, right? If I had, um, if I wanted nearest neighbor interactions, I would just have sort of a single sinusoidal oscillation in the time that it takes to acquire a two pi phase between adjacent sites in my magnetic field gradient. 
Um, if I want longer range interactions, I'll modulate at a higher frequency. And actually, this modulation waveform is precisely the dispersion relation that I'm creating for my spin excitations. Um, actually, up to an overall sign. In our case, the interactions are ferromagnetic. So I can really think of um, in momentum space, um, there's a dispersion relation, which is just minus the modulation waveform. Um, and in this particular system of the, the spin one um, uh, system where we're studying this pair creation physics, we actually operate at a regime where there's an instability to creating these correlated pairs. Um, and and uh, if, if in the presence of the gradient and this modulated drive, that instability is momentum dependent. And actually, so the most unstable momenta are the ones where the energy is at a minimum or equ equivalently um, correspond to sort of the peaks in, in my modulation waveform. So that's kind of a complementary picture is that we can kind of specify which momentum modes are most unstable to pair creation. OK. Um, and this, again, kind of illustrates the flexibility, because if all you're doing is modulating the waveform gives you your dispersion relation, um, that's, that's quite a powerful, powerful tool. OK. So there's another um, insight, though, that um, comes from thinking about this, which is, OK, strictly speaking. Oh, oh, sorry. So let me quickly just show that the data match that. Um, so uh, so here we're kind of showing now actually what is um, the um, basically population of these different momentum modes. Um, what we're measuring is basically spin correlations in the x basis. Um, and um, so on the left, I'm showing you the real space picture, um, uh, looking at correlations as a function of distance and time. And you can kind of see them um, uh, in this particular case, we have interactions at a distance of three sites. And you can see the correlation spreading from three to six to nine sites. Um, but in momentum space, you can think of this as basically we're um, building up uh, a peak in uh, the occupation of um, a momentum mode um, at, at, at a momentum that's two pi by three. Um, and these different curves are just that peak growing over time. OK, so um, this gives us kind of two complementary pictures for thinking about how we engineer these dynamics. Um, and if we actually think very carefully um, about this picture in momentum space, um, there's a subtlety that comes up, which is strictly speaking, um, if I want to talk about sort of the dispersion relation for a finite size system, that's only defined at discrete points in time. Um, and so my students said, well, maybe we shouldn't be using a continuous waveform. Maybe we should actually be pulsing this waveform and turning it on only at discrete times. Um, OK, so, so we do that. So we can actually compare these cases. It turns out if you pulse this waveform, um, then what you actually get um, is a system that is, um, it's precisely the dispersion relation for a finite size system with periodic boundary conditions. Um, and indeed, um, if you look um, at these correlations, you know, you have correlations at some distance of, let's say, three sites, but also at the length of the chain minus three sites. Um, and so, in fact, this is a way of going from having an open chain to having a ring. Um, OK, so that one thing that this illustrates already is that kind of you can effectively have some geometry of your, um, uh, I don't know, some effective geometry that is different from the physical geometry of the spins in the lab. So that's kind of neat. Um, just to kind of give an, another example of this idea that the geometry of the interaction graph doesn't have to be the physical geometry. Well, I'll give a few examples. Um, in a simple case where we just have, let's say, our, our open chain, but when we have interactions at a distance of three sites, if I look at correlations, you know, there it's sort of this, this weird mon non-monotonic function of correlations versus distance. But really, this is kind of just like actually having three decoupled chains. Right, which depend on, you know, 0, 3, 6, and so on are connected, 1, 4, 7 are connected. So maybe I should really think of this as having some kind of new effective geometry. And for example, maybe I could add some additional couplings that will make this not even just 3D coupled chains, but perhaps a 2D system. OK, so let's see, can we explore that a little bit more? Um, so, so, OK, it turns out actually one nice thing that we can do is not just me telling you that I think there's a different effective geometry. We can directly reconstruct the geometry of the system, the effective geometry of the system, from the spin correlations. So the idea is we program in some interaction graph, we measure some correlations, we adopt an unsatz that those correlations decay with distance, let's say, as a Gaussian. And then we ask, what is the best fit embedding of these sites into three dimensions? Um, to explain these correlations, right? So we adopt this onsets of this Gaussian decay and say, where does that mean these sites are effectively sitting in 3D? OK, so just from the spin correlations, you get a picture like this. Um, we've drawn in um, all of the measured correlations um, in a way that the sort of um, 
uh, opacity of the line and uh, indicates the strength of the correlation and the color indicates the sign. Um, and in fact, it tells you there are 3D coupled chains. But now you can do this with a fancier interaction graph. Um, so let's turn on interactions at a distance of one site and a distance of nine sites. Let's add periodic boundary conditions. We can even have some of the interactions be ferromagnetic, that's red, and some of them be anti-ferromagnetic, that's blue. We measure the spin correlations, and now you can um, um, try to predict, you know, what is the geometry that will emerge from this? Okay, so, um, well, I'll just, I'll tell you the answer though. Okay, so if we do this reconstruction of the geometry, this is actually a Mobius strip. Um, so, and this just pops out directly from the measured spin correlation. So all that goes into making this plot is just this correlation information. Um, and so, right, so basically as you go once around this um, uh, chain of sites, you're going all the way around the edge of, the, of this Mobius strip back to where you started. Um, bonds in one direction are ferromagnetic, the correlations in this other direction are anti-ferromagnetic. Um, and I can kind of actually think of this in terms of a spin texture. What's going on is, is the spin is winding once around to explain the fact that we have anti-ferromagnetic correlations at this distance of nine sites and ferromagnetic for the neighbors. Um, cool. So we can build a Mobius strip in the lab. Um, and just to sort of illustrate, here's kind of a gallery of a few other you know, geometries that we can realize just by changing this modulation waveform ranging from you know, the ring or the chains to cylinders with sign changing interactions, um, some fully anti-ferromagnetic ladder. Um, uh, so lots of things you can do just by programming the waveform of the drive field. Um, so this opens up a lot of directions um, for studying you know, spin dynamics and exotic geometries, non-trivial topology, both in terms of the twist and perhaps the winding of the spin. Um, uh, frustration is something that is natural to study here. We can have interactions that change sign with, with distance, which is a sort of key feature of spin glass models from condensed matter physics. Um, and you could even imagine adjusting not just the signs, but the phases of the couplings, which also has applications to topological physics. OK, now some of these are things you can also do in other physical systems. And in thinking about sort of what to do next, you know, we've been somewhat inspired by, by some other platforms. Um, but I want to actually give a flavor of, um, and, and even in, in these applications, let's say topological phases, you can study them in different systems, but there might be some unique features of the cavity. Um, but I want to sort of give a little bit more of um, what, what, what we can do that's really exotic in the cavity using the non-local aspect of the interactions. And so that brings me back. Um, to this um, quantum gravity story. What could one do to study fast scrambling and this holographic type of geometry? Okay, so I've probably spoken too long, but I need to speak a little bit longer because um, this is pretty cool. So <laughs> I hope you'll <laughs> forgive me. So, okay. Um, so actually with Andrew Daly um, and uh, Steve Gubser, um, uh, we had um, been uh, brainstorming about sort of what would be a, a neat model to realize if you want to study uh, fast scrambling in, in the cavity. And the toy model um, that we spent quite a while thinking about, and you can read about it here, is one where you try to efficiently spread information from sort of one to any other atom by having sort of just a sparse set of a few couplings at distances of one site, two sites, four sites, eight sites. So every power of two, you can have interactions. And that you can kind of imagine in sort of a time that's only logarithmic in the system size would let you get information from one point to any other. So we had this toy model, and the idea is you have interactions at distances that are powers of two, um, and if they um, shrink with distance, you can add sort of a power law exponent that lets you tune, do they shrink with distance or do they grow with distance? If they shrink with distance, this wouldn't be too different from just a spin chain um, with local interactions. And for example, if you asked how um, the, the time evolution of correlations, you would expect correlations to sort of spread from some initial site. Um, but if you have interactions that are flat with respect to distance, then um, you uh, would expect actually, again, that information can get from one point to any other in sort of log n steps. Um, and that um, is, looks to be conducive to, to fast scrambling. Okay, so I won't show you results on fast scrambling, but there's another thing that we thought about, which is what happens if the interactions grow with distance. And it turns out if the interactions grow with distance, then the best way to think about this system um, is that we should think of the sites as being kind of the leaves of a tree graph. And so this is a totally different geometry um, that in principle one could mimic by having these interactions that grow with distance. So we said, let's, let's see, can we build that in the lab? We you know, program in these couplings um, that are at powers of two distances and they grow with distance and we measure some correlations. They kind of look like they're at some powers of two distances, so that looks promising. Um, but to say a little bit more, you know, is this really the tree graph? 
Um, how do you know whether you've made the tree graph? Um, so it turns out one way to think about whether we've made the tree graph is to ask, okay, so the tree graph basically comes about um, by looking at the site number in real space and going left or right in the tree um, according to first the least significant bit and then the next least significant bit and ultimately the most significant bit in the site number. So it turns out you can map from position in the chain to position in the tree just by looking at the site number and reversing the order of the bits. Um, and, and, and so this map is called the mono map. And we can apply that to our correlation plot and ask, does do these correlations look simpler if you order the sites according to the tree? And in fact, they do. You start to see some kind of a block structure that illustrates the hierarchical aspect of the tree. Um, and it's no longer this sort of non-monotonic behavior, but in fact, as a function of the correct metric for distance on the tree, the correlations smoothly decay with distance. So we've built this totally different geometry um, just by programming the coupling graph. Um, and now um, the idea is that the tree, the tree itself, it's only the leaves that are physical, right? The rest of the tree is kind of this holographic bulk. Um, so you can ask, can you reconstruct that in the same way that we were reconstructing effective geometries earlier? Um, and so, uh, the, so the protocol my students came up with is, let's start by doing this reconstruction based on correlations of some effective positions of the sites that capture the distances, capture the um, uh, decreasing strength of correlations. Um, but then we can do sort of a coarse graining procedure where we find the strongest couplings and join the spins with the strongest couplings, treat those as a single site, and then iteratively do the same thing and ask um, sort of we draw bonds every time we sort of identify strong couplings. And you do this and you do this with the graph where the interactions grow with distance. And in fact, what shows up is precisely this tree. Um, and so we've um, built this, this tree-like geometry and essentially reconstructed this, this bulk that's supposed to capture um, the, the notion of distance um, uh, that captures the strength of correlations in the quantum system. Um, in the case of the chain where interactions shrink with distance, um, there, there's no notion here of, of an interesting bulk geometry, but in the case of the tree there is, and that's shown by these, these lines. So um, I, I just have to say, um, none of this would have been done without our collaborator, Steve Gubser, who tragically um, passed away in a climbing accident a couple of years ago. This is sort of a, a, a hand sketch from an early email he sent me where we started exploring these ideas. And um, we're really excited to be now able to play with Steve's ideas and keep them alive in the lab. Um, so the idea is that this tree really is kind of acting like some discretized version of curved space and gravity um, and can perhaps start to um, give us uh, a connection between some beautiful abstract mathematics and, and perhaps actually saying something about the nature of, of space time. Um, so with that, I think I'm actually just going to um, wrap up and say, I, I've, I've shown you that we have a really high degree of programmability of the interactions. We can make Mobius strips, we can make trees. Um, we uh, uh, can harness interactions to protect spin coherence. Um, we can um, start to, with these exotic interaction graphs, really um, use this as, in some sense, also a kind of a playground for asking um, to what extent can one have a notion of an effective geometry that emerges just from the spin correlations and reconstruct that in a black box fashion, um, which could have implications for exploring this idea of holographic duality. Um, but we're also interested in many other directions, um, taking this, for example, to studies of frustrated magnetism, magnetism um, or using these non-local interaction graphs to study um, technologically relevant optimization problems. And largely, there are open questions about whether this quantum system can give an advantage for solving those problems. Um, but if you'd like to read about sort of one case that we've studied theoretically, where we know there should be a quantum advantage, um, I just want to advertise um, a recent paper from my group um, on harnessing uh, uh, naturally occurring spin-spin interactions in cavity QED or Rydberg systems to speed up one particular quantum optimization problem called number partitioning. Um, so with that, I will just thank my group and particularly Eric, Avakar, and Philip um, are behind these recent results on programming interactions and reconstructing geometry. Um, and this entire team um, makes this possible. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Monica, for this fantastic talk. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So let's start with one from the chat uh, from Thomas. Are there any aspects of quantum gravity or black holes apart from fast scrambling that seem like feasible directions of research? 
Well, to me, actually, this this last section on um, so so uh, on exploring um, something like this this emergent geometry, right? That actually goes kind of beyond fast scrambling. This question of um, what are the systems where there's some gravitational dual, um, and there are certain models where people can write something down on paper and sort of um, show that there is this mapping from a quantum system to a gravitation to a classical system in one additional dimension with gravity. Um, but sort of how generic is that idea that sort of geometry and gra space time geometry and gravity can emerge from um, quantum mechanics and entanglement? Um, you'd like to be able to study that in cases where you can't necessarily exactly s solve the system. And so having tools for being able to go from quantum correlations, ideally like direct measures of entanglement. So sort of the rigorous, um, there are sort of rigorous formulations about um, connecting uh, entanglement entropy um, to notions of distance and, and the metric um, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the holographic dual. So starting to explore this space of kind of um, reconstructing geometry from spin correlations, to me, um, I, I'm excited by the possibility that that gives you a tool for sort of asking how generic is this principle um, that there's, you know, uh, are models where there's a holographic bulk and where, where there's a geometrical picture for thinking about the structure and entanglement. Um, so again, the fast scrambling is a particular conjecture that relates to the holographic duals of black hole, uh, uh, yeah, black holes and their holographic duals. Um, but black holes aren't the only systems um, for which we have a gravitational description. They're just the simplest ones, right? And so that's why I think this is much more general. Um, yeah. Great. So uh, then um, there is a question. What's the realistic limit of the ratio of the spin couplings to the coherence uh, decay in your system? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so currently I mentioned that we are benefiting from having um, a collective enhancement of the um, atom-light interaction strength. So the kind of figure of merit for the strength of um, atom-light interactions is the single atom cooperativity, which tells me if I have an excited atom, what's the probability it emits a photon into the cavity instead of in some random direction. Um, in our cavity, that number is about seven or so. Um, and actually the mirrors are kind of dirty. So if they hadn't gotten dirty, it was about 200 based on sort of the initial finesse that we had measured. Um, so um, now you lose a little bit from, you know, matrix elements can come in and reduce that number. And um, so, but, so we're in a regime where that single atom cooperativity is larger than one, um, but it's not sort of, it, 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 when you sort of go through the numbers, you realize that um, uh, that's sort of not good enough to have very coherent interactions in a chain of individual atoms. So we get this extra boost um, by having order a thousand atoms per site. Um, Again, if we had sort of the cooperativity of 200 that is reasonable in our system, um, then you could have fewer atoms per site and still have sort of equivalently coherent interactions. Um, but it's still like ultimately there's some challenge in the question of sort of how coherent can you make these interactions in optical cavities. And actually one direction that we're um, um, so, sort of starting to uh, work towards is, is um, can one actually uh, not use optical photons, but for example, use um, millimeter wave photons. That's kind of a new direction that we're um, starting to explore um, in terms of could, could you um, enhance the interaction strength by using sort of a, a different spectral regime. Um, so that's a regime where cooperativities can be 10 to the 8 um, <laughs> um, for sort of Rydberg atoms coupled to, to millimeter wave photons. And that could be a neat sort of like long-term direction for having highly um, coherent non-local interactions. So. Good. So. Uh... Another question, would it be interesting to look at some kind of correlations in the light uh, leaking out of the cavity? Yeah, I think that would definitely be um, interesting. And so um, I'll say that we intentionally operate in a regime where there is minimal information in the light, the light leaking out of the cavity because we want to have maximally coherent interactions. So there would be a trade-off there. But also one can sort of explore more dissipative regimes um, um, uh, where essentially um, by working sort of closer to cavity resonance, you could have more information that's coming out of the cavity. Um, and that is something where I think there's probably a, a huge space of what you could do in, in terms of correlating what's going on inside with what's going out on outside or asking, can you make some 
um, non-classical states of the light with the aid of the atoms. Um, so lots of things you could do there. Our system is not ideally suited to that because I mentioned the mirrors are a bit dirty. So we're not very efficient at getting the light out. And so instead we play with all this information we get from taking images. But I think it's a great direction to explore in the future. A bit related to this one from the chat by uh, Zenkai Lu. Is it like the spin exchange dynamics can be modeled classically based on local atom density and cavity mode? And are there some collective enhancement effects like dick states uh, being observed? Um, so, so in terms of the first question, um, the measurements that I, I sort of showed in the first part of the talk, we can understand from a mean field model where the inputs are just in the local intensity of the cavity mode um, and the um, and the local density of the atoms. Um, generically, you know, the these interactions um, should like the first thing that these interactions should do, for example, is give rise to spin squeezing. Um, so we um, didn't directly look at that. That's you know been done in other experiments with um, Ising interactions, at least. Um, but but so I would say it's not that everything that's going on is classical. Um, for sure, there are, there's interesting um, things happening with the, the quantum correlations. Um, and in, in this pair creation physics, actually, sort of one next direction we want to go is really rigorously. I, I showed things about correlations, but um, can we really rigorously say something about entanglement in this system? That's the direction we want to go. Um, so yeah, and, and so for the pair creation physics, um, this should be a way to make Dicky states. Um, and um, there's some optimization of, of sort of um, detection to be able to show that we have those, those states. Um, and possibly even, we think there may be some, ideally everything happens in F equals one, but there may be some additional things going on where atoms can um, scatter and end up in F equals two that slightly complicates things. So these are sort of technical things that in order to make a high quality Dicky state and detect it, um, we have a little bit of work to do, but that's something we want to explore um, at some point. And uh, technical question. So what limits the quality uh, of coupling to the cavity? How symmetric do you think you can make the coupling in the long run? Um, yeah, okay, so this is a good question. There are kind of two things that can limit this. Um, one is, well, so essentially it's, it has to do with the positions of the atoms in the cavity. Um, and so one effect that you might worry about is um, how large is the strongly coupled region of the cavity? So we have a relatively small waist um, of about 15 microns um, and the corresponding Rayleigh range is order one millimeter. And so that means there's about a millimeter region where you can have reasonably um, uniform couplings to the cavity. Maybe you wanna keep it to, you know, how we, we, we work with about a one millimeter region um, and that's reasonably uniform. Um, uh, but again, sort of the more uniform you want to be, the smaller a region you need to work with. And then there's also the, the um, temperature radially can matter. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so those are both uh, effects that, that can limit it. In some of the earlier experiments, we were actually not in the middle of the cavity and intentionally had some gradient and coupling strengths because it was convenient for um, uh, observing effects like the non-locality of the interactions that spin excitations hopped to the most strongly coupled region. Um, in the later experiments with this array, we intentionally kind of center ourselves in the cavity um, and, and try to make the couplings reasonably uniform, but there are still probably, I would guess, 30% non-uniformities. Um, I don't have the precise number off the top of my head, but, um, and so the two things are kind of, um, one could focus, potentially focus down more if the ensembles are closer together, as long as one is careful about exactly maintaining a good enough imaging resolution. Um, and then one needs to just um, make them as cold as possible. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Monica, once more for the great talk. I will now pass the, the mic to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also, also from my side, Monica, for a very cool talk. Uh, I'd like to remind you that next week on April 8th, we will have yet another cool talk, we think, by Philippe Bouillet, who will talk about atom interferometry. And something you should certainly check out is the virtual AMO seminar that's actually hosted by our speaker, Monica, today. Uh, and tomorrow they will have Andrew Jaich speaking about uh, radioactive ions and molecules. I'd like to also remind you that the uh, deadline for submission to our hot topic session on April 22nd is tomorrow. So send us your applications by tomorrow, April 2nd. If you want to get notified uh, about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list and to our Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter as well. Thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next week. Same time, same place. Bye.